I'm Taylor. And I'm Tyler. And I'm Brad. This is Book of Mormon Central's Come Follow Me Insights. Today, a special Christmas episode. And we're here with our friend Brad, and it'll be a delight to learn together with him as we celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ and all that he's done for us. So this is, this is actually a real treat to have Brad Wilcox. Bradley Wilcox is currently serving as the second counselor in the General Young Men's Presidency for the church. So he, he has a pretty um, extensive background of working with youth and with children, and even before this assignment, you served on the General Sunday School Board when uh, President Russ Osgathorpe was the General, Young, or the General Sunday School President, and at that time, that's when the, this whole come follow me idea was, was being uh, discussed. Yeah, right? it was really a fascinating thing to watch because to see what come follow me is today and then to go back to those early days when it was just being pioneered and the inspiration, the revelation was just starting to come. And uh, it was the first time in the history of the church that the Sunday School Presidency, the Young Men Presidency, the Young Women Presidency, and the seminary leaders were all sitting at the same table saying we need to bring this together. And since then, you realize what's happened because now the adult curriculum has been brought in line, the primary curriculum is brought in line. And so I'm grateful for some of those early efforts that have led to what we are now enjoying today where we're all on the same page and uh, it's such a blessing. I think that's what has allowed for uh, these kind of supplementary study experiences to blossom and I'm so grateful for them. We have a man in our ward who joined the church right before, uh, his name is Don, and his wife, Jean, had always been a member, but he joined, well, she was a convert as a young person, but they'd, he joined the church right before the COVID shut down, and so I worried about him, and I thought, how is he going to be able to get the spiritual nourishment that he needs? But it's be, been through these supplemental experiences that are available that he, through all of that COVID time and now continuing, he is able to feel nurtured and nourished by the good word of God. So I appreciate my friends here for the good we that you're doing, you. and uh, I love being a part of this today. This is a real treat for us to have Brad join us today because he has the, the unique distinction of, of having his birthday on Christmas Day, December 25th. What, what was that like growing up as a kid, <laughs> well, having everything on one day? I need to point out, you know, I've got my red tie on, you've got your Father Christmas tie on, here we've got some peppermint stripes going on over here. So yeah, I guess we're all celebrating, we're in the Christmas mood. But it really has been, it has been fun to have a birthday on Christmas. Um, when I was in the South one time, I passed by a Christian church and they had a big marquee out front and it said, Christmas is not your birthday. And I mean, I understood the point they were trying to make and it was, it's a good point, but I had to disagree because Christmas is my birthday. I was born right on the 25th and my mom was always afraid that that would mean my, that my birthday would be overlooked. So she started a tradition in our home of putting up two Christmas trees, one for Jesus, and one for Brad. <laughs> and my brothers were supposed to put a gift for me under each tree, which worked out great until my older brother got smart and decided he'd put a pair of mittens, buy me a pair of mittens. And he put one mitten under the Christmas tree and one mitten under the birthday tree. And it went downhill Hilarious. after that. These days, I usually just get a Merry Christmas, Happy Birthday combination card. Uh, my cousin sent me one that said, being born on Christmas is quite unique because you never know who brought you, the stork or Santa Claus. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. So you're wearing the right tie for <laughs> That's me. That's good. So we, we are very grateful to have Brad join us on this particular episode, and he has been a, a dear friend and a colleague and a mentor of mine for, for many years, and uh, we're just grateful that you would be willing to come and share some of some of your thoughts about Thanks. Christmas and, and the birth of Christ as Happy we celebrate this incredible incredible event. You'll notice that uh, in scriptures, whether it's in the Book of Mormon 
or the Doctrine and Covenants or the New Testament, whenever it starts talking about things like the glad tidings of great joy or this good news, it's usually attached to this incredible event, the, the coming of Christ, where this the, the Lord of the universe, creator of worlds without number, condescended and became one of us. He, he took on flesh and, and took on that human uh, – all of the human struggles that we face, and he, he breathed our air and he walked our soil. And so we're gonna we're gonna celebrate this this incredible event today. Yeah, let's take a look at the Luke two scriptures, and we're gonna find a scripture that most of us can recite from memory, be, just because we've heard it so often, as we've read the Christmas story over and over and over. But uh, but Tyler, maybe you could read that scripture for us. It talks about three things that we're gonna discuss for a moment together. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Let's talk for just a few moments about swaddling clothes, about mangers, and about inns. First of all, swaddling clothes, bands of cloth that were used to wrap around the newborn infant uh, to keep it from flailing to keep the baby from hurting himself or herself, and also uh, to, to uh, make the baby feel secure, make the baby feel, you know, uh, like the baby's still in the womb, just, just secure and snug. Or wrapped in a warm embrace. Yeah, wrap, wrapped in an embrace, wrapped in, in mom's arms. And so that's the reason for swaddling clothes. But the interesting thing is to think about how this was promised as a sign to the Savior. A sign of the Savior. Well, how can that be a sign of the Savior when every baby was probably swaddled? The swaddling clothes uh, in and of themselves probably weren't the sign, but the particular swaddling clothes that were wrapped around Christ could have been the sign. Jack Welch, a good friend of ours and a wonderful scholar, he has done some research and says that perhaps the swaddling clothes that were wrapped around the baby Jesus were not just white bands of cloth, but they were special bands of cloth, embroidered bands of cloth with the signs and symbols of his family heritage. So think about that. You've got a baby being wrapped in special uh, cloth. Jack Welch talks about how anciently in Jewish weddings they would take the couple's hands and tie them loosely together with uh, a, 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 some swaddling clothes, with, with a band of cloth, and that this band of cloth, then that's where we get the, you love words and you know words, but that's where we get the saying, tying the knot. Mm -hmm. Tying the knot it comes from that tradition. Well, so it's not, un, it's not unrealistic or unreasonable to think that then a couple would use those very special bonds, those very mm -hmm. special pieces of cloth embroidered with their family history and wrap their new baby in that. That's how they could tell that this was their baby and not get it mixed up with another baby. I mean, we worry about switching babies in hospitals. I'm sure they worried a little bit about switching babies in their day too. But it also, that those bands could have been blue and white. The royal, the royal colors of the house of David, which is where he was born through. And then they could have had embroidered symbols of lions and lambs, which are the symbols of Judah, the tribe of Judah, and he was the lion of Judah. So I think maybe the shepherds would recognize him, not just because he was swaddled, but because, as Jack Welch has taught us, maybe he was swaddled with some very special bands. Isn't that a beautiful, a, a beautiful journey back in time? to a different place, a different culture, different setting, different traditions, but I love 
Brad, how you can take that example of swaddling clothes of how we can maybe recognize Christ by what by what he's he's wrapped in, and as you both said, this idea of this secure, warm, comforting covering for him. And now that we've talked about it in history, to now bring that off of the scripture page and bring it forward in time to today, and to now own that story for us, and think about what Christ offers you. Think about what he offers us. He doesn't leave us comfortless. He doesn't leave us without a covering for our spiritual nakedness, for our exposure to, to the law and to the elements and to, to the eternal struggles that we sometimes face. He offers us clothing, and how does, just like we can recognize him by what he's swaddled in, he can recognize us by us choosing to put on his covering that he has offered us so that we can also feel warm, safe, secure in the arms of his love and his mercy and in the covering that he offers us today. Think about what the word for atonement comes from, kafar. Mm -hmm. I mean, to cover. To cover. Mm -hmm. And he's covered in these swaddling bands. And we are covered in him and in his atonement. Mm -hmm. Well, the scripture also talks about, along with swaddling clothes, it talks about mangers, and that's a very interesting thing for us to think about because we usually think of wooden mangers because we come from kind of a European tradition, and so all the little manger scenes, all the little, um, they always have a little wooden manger, but in Israel there's not a lot of wood, so the manger probably was made of stone, and Mr. Word Smith over here, what does manger mean? Manger in French means to eat. So it's the eating trough. It's where the animals would go to eat food. And it's incredible symbolism. Here you have the bread of life himself in a place where animals come to eat. And the invitation for all of us at sacrament every week is that we get to partake of Jesus, of his flesh and body and of his blood, and that heals us, it uplifts us, it saves us. And I just love the symbolism. In fact, you were going to tell us about what the word Bethlehem means. Well, Bethlehem means house of bread. Is there a more fitting place for the Savior of the world to be born than in the house of bread, the bread of life coming to the house of bread? But when you visit Israel, you find out that Bethlehem is also the source of water. It's where the water flows from to reach Jerusalem, and so it also is a source of living water. And I just love that, that image of Christ, the bread of life, the living water, being born in this place where it was the house of bread and the source of water. Yeah. The other, the other factor there with Bethlehem is it, we learn in the scriptures that it is the least of all of the villages of Judah. It's, it's this small little town. It's not the capital city. It's not the center of their universe, so to speak. It's, it's very easy to ignore Bethlehem, this, this little podunk town, if you will. And isn't it interesting that the king of heaven, when he comes to this earth, he doesn't come into the capitals. He's not born in the city of Jerusalem, the big capital. He's born so quietly and so so serenely in this corner of, of, of the stable and laid in a manger where there's no fanfare. There's, there's, there, there aren't a lot of people there to celebrate this, and most people have totally missed all of the signs because they're just not looking for them. And uh, I love that, how silently, how silently the wondrous gift was given. Um, so God imparts to human hearts the, the blessings of his heaven. He, Jesus is the embodiment of everything, and now he's here. He's with us. But he's in this little, little body, this human body, that the word that created worlds without number, now his mouth can't even talk. The hand that is so mighty and powerful throughout all those Old Testament stories, 
Well, now that hand can't even control what it's doing. He has fully condescended. He has fully become one of us in these swaddling clothes and laid, as they said, in a manger. A stone trough. And you know, that's that condescension. I think the condescension is seen in these words that we're examining, the swaddling clothes, the manger, but also in the words for in. Now, the American Bible, uh, the American Bible Society talks about three types of inns in biblical times. One was a large room where travelers could come and they could pay for a little piece of ground, and they all slept in the same room, but it gave them a place by the fire and it gave them safety from the robbers and the thieves. So that was great, and many people were happy to, to be there together. Uh, but that's probably not the inn. Yeah, yeah, those, if you go over to, to the Mediterranean region today, you, you still see some elements of those. They're, they're caravansaries. They're, they're these big, common places providing that protection, but that's probably not what we're talking about here. Yeah. And then we read about the inn that, where Jesus is talking about in the parable of the Good Samaritan. And there was a public building where you could pay for food and pay for lodging, and that would be more like what we think of today as a motel or a hotel, but that probably wasn't the inn that Jesus is talking about, or that, that Luke is talking about here, because Bethlehem, as you said, was on the outskirts. It wasn't a trade route. It wasn't a caravan route. It wasn't a place where people would want to go and, and stay in a nice public house. So the inn we're talking about has more to do with a guest room rather than one of these other types. Um, and Luke 2 isn't the only place we read about this guest room. That's right. The, if, if you look at the Greek word uh, underlying the word in here, it's katalama. Well, the word katalama in Greek, as Brad's saying, it's, it's just a guest room. So if you've got a small house, you would have a small katalama. If you've got a bigger home, you would have a bigger katalama. It's a big common room. Today, at least in the United States, we would refer to these usually as your front room. It's just, it's a big room, and sometimes it would be upstairs, just a big bonus room, big open space where you could have uh, guests come, family members do, do festival kinds of things for these Jewish people. You'll notice, if you look in the Greek, that the word katalama only appears two other times total in the New Testament, and both times, one in Luke, one in Mark, it refers to Jesus and his apostles going to the, and then there it gets translated as guest chamber, but we refer to it in, in the way we're, we teach Jesus' story as the upper room. It's where he goes to have the Last, the Last Supper with his apostles. So in Mark and Luke, the only other place that we use the word katalama is where Jesus ate the Last Supper in, in that upper room setting in Jerusalem. So, this tells us something, that this, these are not businesses like hotels, motels, or caravansaries. That, it's family. This is family. These are, these are houses. And by the way, what did Joseph Smith do to that verse? See, Joseph Smith, in the, in the inspired version of the Bible, he replaced the word in with ins. He made it plural. Now, there's something significant about that. So something very interesting about that. If, if you look at why are we even coming to Bethlehem? If Joseph and Mary, his espoused wife, have been living 80 miles north up in Galilee in Nazareth, why are we making this long journey to come down to, to do this census from Caesar Augustus? Why can't we just be counted up in Galilee? Well, everybody under this census has to go to your hometown or where you own land or property or where you're associated with people in these relationships. That tells us that Joseph and Mary, who is related to Joseph, his hometown is Bethlehem. He had to go there for this census, which tells us many of the people who live in this little village are going to be relatives of Joseph and Mary. So what's the significance here? Yeah, so if they're relatives, don't you think that they would make room? Well, maybe. I mean, maybe it's just a statement of fact. There was no room for them in the inns because maybe they were just already full of relatives, and we have to give them the benefit of the doubt. But 
she's pregnant. She's about to deliver a baby. So you'd think that relatives of all people would be willing to say, hey, I'll sleep outside, but that's not what happens. What I love is that Jesus finds no room in the inn, or at least his parents. And what does Jesus do for all of us? He makes room for us in the upper room if in the heavens. So even though he was not invited in earthly into the upper room, he descended below all things to uplift all of us into the upper room. I find some interesting symbolism there. Yeah. And his relatives weren't willing to invite Mary and Joseph into the guest room. Maybe because they'd done the math. They, they knew that this baby was not, uh, not Joseph's. And I mean, they knew when they got married. That's right. And they knew that the baby was coming, and now all of a sudden, they're making a judgment here. So stop and think about that for a minute. Hmm. Here you have a young handmaid of the Lord who is so highly favored of God. She, she, Blessed art thou among women, Elizabeth's going to tell her, and, and the angel's going to refer to her as this blessed uh, handmaid. She is so highly favored of God, and she, she gives her life over, be it unto me according to thy word, here I am, do whatever, whatever needs to happen, and in the process of being so highly favored of God, it's probable that she becomes highly despised and rejected of mankind, of people around her. There's something hauntingly beautiful about the symbolism of what Mary is going to go through at a fairly young age because of being chosen to be the mother of the Son of God, that she's going to be despised and rejected of mankind. There's something beautifully Christ-like about Jesus' own mother and what she goes through. And isn't it ironic that the scriptures, especially in Luke, because you don't get Mary's story in Matthew, you don't get anything from the birth in Mark, and you don't get anything specific about the birth in John, so it's only from Luke's perspective that we're getting this where the one person who could tell us all about that birth experience, he sums it up by saying, Mary kept all these things in her heart. She just, she doesn't, she doesn't share widely her experience. She knows, she knows who this baby is, and she knows that she's being punished and, and treated poorly by certain people because of, of giving birth to this son, but she knows, she knows who he is. Isn't that interesting? The other first witness of this birth happens to be Elizabeth. When she was six months pregnant, Mary up in the north in Galilee had that interchange with the angel, and then she leaves Galilee. I think we can understand why yeah. she would want to leave yeah. Galilee. When you think about this, you understand why she would leave. So, as she comes into her close relative Elizabeth's house and she salutes her, Elizabeth, it's me, uh, that little babe, John the Baptist, leaps six months along in the womb, plus a little bit, and he leaps in the womb and his mother is filled with the Spirit, and she recognizes who just walked through the door. It's not just her close relative Mary and she, she declares her witness. Isn't that interesting that John the Baptist, who's appointed to be the forerunner for Christ, to bear testimony of Christ, who's the first person that he bore testimony to? It was an audience of one, his mother, and the Holy Ghost bore witness of his testimony, and he testified in the only way he could, yeah. leaping in the womb, and the Holy Ghost brings that message home, and our first two witnesses that Jesus is the Son of God, the Savior and Redeemer of the world, comes to Mary and Elizabeth in our scripture account. Uh, I love that. I love that these two women, two impossible births from Luke chapter 1 and 2, a woman who's too old to have a baby and a woman who's never been married and never known a man, but nothing is impossible with the Lord. Beautiful. Tyler. 
Um, would you read again the verse we started with, okay. and maybe this time you can hear it through new ears and see it through new eyes. Maybe this time you can listen and understand it a little bit better. I love that. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inns. Beautiful. I hope today we will recognize our Savior, not because he's still in swaddling clothes, but because of the marks in his hands, in his feet. We won't recognize him by embroidered symbols on swaddling bands, but we will recognize him because of the signs and tokens that he has given us. I hope that as we think about um, the mangers, we'll recognize that Jesus isn't in a manger. The whole world thinks of Christ still being in a manger, but we understand that he is at the head of this church today. And I hope that as we think about finding room for him in the inn, in the inns, I hope that we will recognize that we also have to find room for him in our hearts, in our homes, in our lives. And maybe these insights can help us all celebrate Christmas just a little bit differently this year. That's beautiful. You know, there's that old saying some of you have probably heard before. Am I part of the in crowd or am I one of the stable few? And uh, my mom used to always say that. <laughs> that's, a, that's, a good, that's a good rhetorical question for everybody to just ponder and find ways to, to be a little more stable and maybe a little less a part of the world's uh, crowd in the end. Beautiful. Well, we know that uh, Jesus' birth isn't the only one we're celebrating this December. We're also celebrating, and mine isn't either, mine isn't the only one we're celebrating, but we're also celebrating the, the birth of Joseph Smith. Now, we don't honor Joseph in the same way we honor the Savior by any stretch of the imagination, but he was born on the 23rd of December, and through Joseph Smith, we certainly come to know the Savior better. I thought that since we've been studying uh, Doctrine and Covenants this year, and since we're ending our study of the Doctrine and Covenants, and since we've learned so much about church history and about Joseph Smith, I just thought it would be interesting to share a little bit about Joseph Smith and his birth in Sharon, Vermont. He was born in a small cabin that was owned by his mother's father. So his grandfather, Solomon Mack, owned the cabin. And I can just imagine that that was such a happy time for the Smith family to have this little baby born at Christmas time. My mom says that that's always been the happy memory for her, uh, uh, having a baby at Christmas time. So I'm sure it was for Lucy Mack Smith to also have that baby at Christmas time. And it must have been a happy thing. But happy Christmases were not to be Joseph's lot through most of his life. I'm just going to run through a few years. Tyler, maybe you can jot those down up here so people can keep track of them. But let's start with 1823. In December of 1823, Joseph was mourning the death of his older brother, Alvin. This brother that had such an impact on Joseph was such an example to Joseph, someone Joseph looked to as a hero, and he died. In 1828, Joseph and Emma were mourning the loss of their first child who died, and at what, that was at the same time that they were struggling with the disappearance of the 116 pages of the manuscript of the Book of Mormon uh, that they had been translating and working on for so long, and now it was gone. And J Joseph was, you know, Joseph had lost the ability to translate, and he felt condemned by God. I mean, that was not a very happy time. Can I, can I interrupt you there yes. for just a second? It's, oh, I should get out of the I, way so I that think you can see the board. I think it's interesting that they chose to name that firstborn son of theirs Alvin. And he died. 
yeah. named after Joseph's oldest brother. Well, you can see the love that Joseph had for his brother to name his firstborn, Absolutely. Alvin. Um, let's take a look at 1833 or 1832, and it was right at Christmas that Joseph has the revelation about the Civil War coming and the exact place the Civil War will start. Not only is this incredible evidence that Joseph was indeed a prophet, it's recorded in Doctrine and Covenants 87, but nothing like war to kind of ruin Christmas Merry for Christmas. you. Merry Christmas. There's, yeah. there's war coming. <laughs> I mean, that just wasn't the exact Christmas message that I'm sure Joseph Smith was hoping to receive. In 1833, he was grieving because of the expulsion of the saints from Jackson County. Then it was at Christmas time in 1837 that the small banks failed. Now, this was a failure that was happening nationwide, but it certainly affected the Kirtland Safety Society. And then people turned their hurt into anger and focused it on Joseph Smith, even some of his dearest friends were turning against him. It was a time of hateful accusations and bitter apostasy, and that was all happening in December of 37. Then in December of 1838, Joseph was languishing in Liberty Jail. It was there he was spending this horrific winter, not just suffering physically, but suffering emotionally suffering psychologically as he was dealing with the fact that he was there because some of his very best friends had stabbed him in the back, had turned against him. In 1842, perhaps this, and I don't know, but I think that perhaps this must have been the hardest Christmas of all, because Emma delivered a son who died at birth, and it was on the day after Christmas. Joseph was born on the 23rd of December. They'd celebrated that birth. He must have been so excited to have a baby coming right at Christmas time. And then the day after Christmas, that baby came and died. How hard that would have been for Emma, how hard that would have been for Joseph. They lost other children too, and every death was so hard and painful. But to happen at Christmas time, I mean, that just really must have been difficult. Now, those weren't the only Christmases that Joseph had. He had happy Christmases as well. So let's mention 1835, because in his own journal, Joseph writes about slaying with his children in the new fallen snow. Here's a prophet writing in his journal about spending the day going sleigh riding with his children in fresh new fallen snow. What a Christmas. What a Christmas to remember. He also talked about spending the entire day just with family. For Joseph, that was a rare thing, especially because he always was living in the homes of other people. But here he is saying, I spent the whole day with my family. That must have brought him great joy. Finally, let's talk about 1843. He says that it was full of caroling, visits with friends and family. It was full of delicious dinners. Now, this starts sounding a lot like our Christmas celebrations. It was full of good music, and it was full of dancing, and the cherry on the, on the Sunday, the cherry on top, was that Oren Porter Rockwell, his dear friend, shows up at his door, having spent a year in prison in Missouri. And when he shows up, he shows up right on Christmas to bring the prophets so much joy. So yeah, there were probably happy times as well as sad times. But I've always found it kind of inconsistent that the world, the Christian world, celebrates an angel coming to a young girl named Mary. They do it every Christmas, and nobody doubts it. Nobody says, oh, well, did an angel really come to Mary? I mean, you know, what are the chances of that? Nobody doubts it. They celebrate it. And yet that same Christian world, by and large, discounts 
the possibility of an angel coming to a young boy named Joseph. We have a lot of people in the world who are giving up their belief in God, but I think the very fact that God would send an angel to a little girl named Mary and send an angel to a young man, a little boy named Joseph, I, I think that is evidence that even though people in the world are giving up on God, he is not giving up on us. Not at all. I want to remind everyone who's listening today that the Messiah who came to a manger is the same Messiah who came to a grove of trees in upstate New York. The same Messiah who came to the world in the meridian of time is the same Messiah who came to the temple in Kirtland, the same Messiah who came in Nauvoo, who came in Missouri, who led his church. The same one who led his church anciently is the same Messiah who was leading his church in our day. He came to Paul on the road to Damascus, and he certainly came to Joseph Smith many times in his life. It's through Joseph that we come to know Jesus just a little bit better. So aren't we glad for the insights, for the vision, for the, the understanding we have of Jesus Christ, whose birth we celebrate on December 25th, because of a prophet named Joseph Smith, the scriptures he brought forth, the temple endowment that he brought forth, the revelations he brought forth. We understand Jesus because of the birth of another baby who was born on December 23rd. I want to I want to take an opportunity to share a little personal experience with you that my family had uh, back in Christmas season of 2010. Uh, to set the stage for this, we were living in, in Cache Valley, Utah, up in Providence, Utah. I had been teaching institute at the Logan LDS Institute there next to the campus of Utah State University. But uh, early in 2010, I had gotten an invitation to join the faculty at Brigham Young University in Provo. And so we had put our home on the market early in, in spring of that year. But in order to sell that home, we, we had cleared out most of our furniture and most of our belongings and put them in a big storage shed because we thought we were going to make that move in the summer. That was our plan. Well, you can guess what elements went into the very back of this big storage shed. It was all of our storage, things like our Christmas decorations. Well, you can anticipate what happened. Summer came, we still hadn't sold the home. I'm making all these improvements that I can, lowering the price, it's still not selling. And uh, the school year starts, we still haven't sold the home up in Cash Valley, and now I'm teaching down in Provo, two, two and a half hours away. And so that's when uh, Kay and Mava Moon offered to let me stay in their basement during the week while I'm teaching, and then I would drive home every weekend. We finally, finally got the home under contract in mid-November, and it was going to sell in the middle of December, which means we're making a move right here in this Christmas season. My wife, Kiplin, loves traditions and she loves decorations, and Christmas is her favorite. Well, we couldn't get to any of our Christmas decorations because they were at the back of a very big storage unit. And so we, as a family, just decided, all right, we're, we're, we're going to be celebrating Christmas, uh, the Christmas season without any decorations. I'll never forget the Sunday. My wife was giving her final lesson. This is at the, the, the first Sunday of December. She's, she's teaching a church in this lesson, and, and she shared that fact that we don't, we don't have any of the trimmings and trappings, but it wasn't going to, to uh, 
detract from our celebration of Christmas and the real focus of Christmas being on Christ. Right after that lesson, that first Sunday, our next-door neighbor, who also happened to be the Relief Society president at the time, Dina Mendenhall, she came up to me in the hall of the church and she said, Tyler, do you trust me? I said, of course I trust you, Sister Mendenhall. She said, can you give me the keys to your house? I thought, this is a strange request, but sure, so I, I pulled my keys out of my pocket and I, I gave them to her. She said, I'll, I'll, I'll get them back to you. An hour later, as church was ending, she came up to me and with a smile on her face said, here are your keys. I had no idea what she had done. We loaded our kids in the car and drove home, came into the driveway, and as we pulled in, I looked in and I could see through the, the curtains, the, the sheer curtains, I could see some Christmas lights inside of our front room. I thought, oh, she put up some Christmas lights. We got everybody out of the car and we opened the front door and went in, and in our front room, during that hour, God sent two angels, Dina Mendenhall and her counselor, Sherry Crosby, had come to our home, and in that front room, there wasn't just a little Christmas tree, there, there was a full-blown Christmas tree, decorated. There was a nativity set, <clears throat> there were some garlands and some other decorations across the top of our piano. We went in and, and my dear wife saw that and she felt the love of God. And I remember Kiplin just sitting down on the stairs uh, and just weeping, feeling a hug from heaven. The Griffin family would have been just fine that Christmas season without any decorations, but oh how sweet it was to walk in and see what these two angels from our ward had done for our family, and not just because of the tree and the nativity set and the other stuff that was brought in, but because of the hug from heaven that those elements became. Uh, and then it was a few days later that her sister, Tamara Cantwell, and her kids, when we had been out, she had a key to our house anyway, she had come in and she put more garlands and, and more uh, lights up to help us feel, feel that, uh, the, the joy of that season. I realize there are families this Christmas season who have real struggles and real difficulties that they're facing that are, that are astronomically bigger than that little struggle that the Griffin family was having in 2010. I get that. But it's interesting to me that God sometimes goes the extra mile to make his love and his mercy and his grace manifest. Uh, so as you celebrate this Christmas season, I want to sh uh, share a little poem that Kiplin wrote around the same time. It's called The Reason. Silver sparkling rib ribbons, bows of red and gold, glossy ornate paper rolls decked with patterns bold, gifts all shape and sizes spread their cheer cheerful ray, sitting neath the lighted tree awaiting Christmas Day. Yet pausing, I remember a clear and holy night without the garnish packages, without the colors bright. The Christmas gift, an infant small, wrapped in swaddling bands. No bows or ribbons dress this child, yet light enwraps the lands. A light to pierce through darkness, a light for ransom sold, a light to conquer death and hell, a light to safe enfold. As all my bright wrapped packages fade from memory's sight, the gift of his redeeming love wraps my soul in light. Brothers and sisters, as we come to a close of this year 
of studying our Come Follow Me curriculum from the Doctrine and Covenants in Church history and from the lives of all these incredible people, we have shared many, many things that we know, many things that we've studied, many things that we've learned with you. I want to finish this year by sharing some things that I know, that I know deep in my heart, not just in my mind. I know that God lives. I know that Jesus is the Christ. He is our Savior and Redeemer, but he's your Savior and Redeemer, and he's my Savior and Redeemer. He's, he's not just the infinite Redeemer and the infinite Atoner. He's, he's our personal Savior as well. He loves you. He gave his life for you. He has more faith in you and in me than we'll ever be able to have in him in return. He, he is giving us everything we need to be able to move forward in faith. No, we're not getting everything. We're not getting all the answers. We're not getting all the solutions that maybe we want when we want them, but we're getting enough to trust him. So as we come to the close of this uh, curriculum year celebrating Christmas, I want to leave with you my thoughts that even though Jesus wasn't given any of those trimmings and trappings of Christmas 2,000 years ago, nor his mother, nor his stepfather, he goes out of his way to provide those sweet things of, of the eternities and symbols of those the, – the sweetness of the eternities for us today. And I love him with all my heart, and I want to I wanna serve him in any way I possibly can, knowing that we will never be able to repay him for what he has given us. But I love him, and I leave that with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. I want to express my love to each of you for your love for God, your dedication to his word, for your desire and faithfulness to engage in studying the gospel, studying the scriptures. I've been heartened as I've traveled around in the past many months and have engaged with people online and face-to-face -face about what's been going on in their lives as they've taken the gospel more seriously, scripture study more seriously, as they have felt God's Spirit enlighten them. It has enlightened me. And I want to just conclude simply. I have a simple testimony. I have felt God's love in my life. I know it undeniably. I have felt him heal me of pain I've caused myself. I've seen him heal other people. I know that he loves you. I have felt his love for me. As you embark on this upcoming year, trust that God is with you. Let the light of the season go with you wherever you are and remember the love that you have felt and trust in that and you will always be guided to the light. The Living Christ document testifies that Jesus is alive today and it testifies that he will come again. For many people in the world, his coming as a baby is very real. It's something they don't doubt. And I hope that his second coming can be just as real. It will be different. He will come in glory. But I hope that it will be just as real in our minds and in our hearts as his birth over 2,000 years ago. I hope that it will be something that is that real and that motivating to us. Living prophets testify of Christ. There were many living prophets and apostles who signed the Living Christ document. And I just want you this Christmas to add your own signature. You sign a copy of that document. And you let your families know your testimonies of a living Christ, a Christ who came and a Christ who will come again. I can add my witness to the many witnesses that have been given of him, and I do it with great humility, I do it with great reverence, 
but I do it. And I hope that you can too. And I say this in the name of Jesus Christ, the Messiah in a manger. Amen. Thank you for joining us for Come Follow Me during the Doctrine and Covenants year. We want to invite you to participate with us again in the Old Testament year. We're already underway filming for the Old Testament. It's a glorious book of Scripture, and we are excited to share with you the spirit and the knowledge that God has provided that all of us can feel uplifted and drawn closer to his presence. Know that you are loved. Thank you, and have a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. See you next year. Thank you.